Welcome back to another episode of Another Perspective, where I turn you from another gallery, sit down with friends all over the world to talk and to learn new perspectives around Indonesian textile art. Today, I'm talking to Azrina and Yes, the duo behind Batik Tektura, a brand from Malaysia that combines both batik and architecture. It sounds very interesting and I can't wait to talk to them. So now sit back, relax, and enjoy Azrina and Yes. Another perspective. Yeah. Welcome, Azrina, and yes, to today's episode of Another Perspective. Uh, how are you guys doing? Good. I'm good. Um, well, we're still in the um, uh, MCO, uh, which is the, you know the restriction that we have all have to stay at home. So yeah. we can't cross district, we can't uh, cross states, but we're fine. Um, so long as you know the COVID cases are in Malaysia is pretty bad right now. So, so we are staying put. Um, so we conduct our businesses from home, uh, do a lot of engagements at home. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. but for me, I'm good. How about you? Yes. Uh, we're all we're all good here in Kuala Terengganu. Um, it's just that I cannot go to the beach because uh, it's beach off now because we are still in MCO. So hopefully that they will lift our MCO by next week uh, because I'm in, I'm in a different state and the numbers here are pretty low. So there is a high chance they will lift the MCO for us next week. Uh, are you guys located in the same area? <laughs> I'm I'm 400 kilometers away from Azrina. It's about eight hours. It's about six hours drive. Uh, I see. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll be talking a little bit more about uh, how you guys work long distance and all. Uh, so I first actually talked to Umi Umi Junit who does batik and natural dyes a couple of weeks ago, and then we were like talking because uh, I was talking that oh. I would love to, you know, because of like the discussion between Indonesia and Malaysian batik, and I just would like to talk to the Malaysian batik practitioners, like who else, like okay, I can Great. talk to. And then she gave like some uh, accounts, and I was taking a look at batik tektura uh, accounts, and the motif is really, really unique because it's neither traditional Malaysian or traditional Indonesian and that is something that I would like to learn more about today and yeah maybe be- before we discuss further uh, could you be able to introduce a little bit about yourself and how's, uh, how do you encounter Batik and fall in love with it? Um, I'm Azrina. Um, I-, I guess you can say that uh, Batik uh, is something that we uh, you know, I came from a corporate background, and at that time, you know, I was feeling a little bit, um, you know, my soul was a little bit <laughs> uh, feeling like I need an outlet, you know, to express all the um, stress or the daily stress of being a banker. So, you know, I remember when I was young, I always uh, go out with my mom to look for textiles, you know, to make baju kurung and all that. And those were the, the, the happiest moments of my life. You know, I really enjoyed looking at textiles, looking at colors, looking at patterns. And I felt that, you know, I need that kind of outlet for myself. Um, but me, um, uh, I know that uh, I didn't have any design background, any textile background, fashion tech background. So I had to think about if I want to do something on fabric, you know, um, on, on textile, what would it be? So because Malaysia... You know, we have our Malaysian batik, you know. So batik is actually a technique that's quite accessible, accessible to a lot of people. You know, you can just do batik at your home, you know, at your own backyard. You don't have to have like a proper machinery or equipment to do it. So uh, I I started like wanted to explore. I started thinking that, you know, maybe I should explore doing batik as an outlet, you know, as a creative outlet, you know, just so I wouldn't feel so stressed out. So I thought about, who I could collaborate with, you know, to actually uh, start this little tiny project, you know, a, a little project with me. And I called Yes, <laughs> and she was like, I'm on it, I'm with you. For like, I, I just had to explain to her for like two minutes and she's like, let's do it. So um, what started as just like a, a passion project, you know, we, we did like a little batches for ourselves, for our family. 
but then word got around you know from our family extended family friends and then it got bigger and then the media started interviewing us so that when that's when it meant a little bit boom and so here we are now but as of now we are still doing it uh, as on a part-time basis because um we work uh yes well i work uh but you know moving forward we want to make it more of our full-time uh, full-time entrepreneurial work you know something that we want to take it to a, a, another level yeah so yes you want to add anything to that how, how did i sound when i talked to you on the first day like desperate yeah. help me <laughs> um yeah uh, i'm yes um well friends call me yes um i'm i'm a professional architect by profession um i run a small firm here in Kuala Terengganu. Um, um, I'm actually from PJ. Well, me and Azrina, we went to the same school in secondary school. And then we were sent to the same boarding school in Taiping, Perak, for two years. And again, we went to the same A-levels college in the UK. So we've been together for quite some time. In fact, in UK, we were housemates. You know? Housemates, yeah. So it's always me and Azuna doing all the all the stuff, you know. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're quite close uh, for some time already. Um, and then we split up for university. And I didn't meet her again until 2012. There was a reunion. So we got connected again um, that time. Um, and then uh, in 2016 or 17, um, at that time, I was already um, practicing uh, because I didn't start to practice not until 2015. So I was actually drawing something and then she called me and she goes like, you know, I'm bored with what I'm wearing right now, you know, etc, etc. So she said, can you like design something for me? So I told her, well, actually, I had this idea because it was just before the fasting month when she called me up. So I said, you know, I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to do a batik bag for hijab, you know. So I said, yeah, maybe we can um, get together and think about it and uh, produce something. So I think I went to Kuala Lumpur uh, to see her at a mall so you know we were just like discussing over some uh, coffee and stuff and we we think of a name and what we want to do and then um um that's how we got started so here in Kuala Terengganu my mom is from Kuala Terengganu um so she was born and bred here so when I was uh, a little girl whenever we come back to Kuala Terengganu she would always take me to the Pasar Payang and you know we would just go shopping for batik and uh, because my mom she's somebody who likes like all this traditional craft so we would go to the batik workshops in the kampung in the villages so when I was small there were many many small workshops everywhere you know so she would go from one workshop to another workshop and she would have her design custom made so uh, so I have been introduced to batik since I was small. And when we were in boarding school, I took batik as my arts elective. Um, and then um, um, I stopped doing batik for quite some time. Uh, when I came back here, um, I think in 2012, I started my, my batik. I started off with uh, drawing painting on uh, painting batik, you know, it was batik, batik painting, not on fabric, but I was like doing sceneries and stuff like that. Uh, then I stopped because I almost burned my kitchen. <laughs> um, until Azrina called me again in what, 2016? 16 or 17, yeah, and we got started again. Yeah. So that's how we, well, and, I, I, and you asked me just now, how do we work long distance? Well, because um most of my families are back in KL so I normally go to KL like um once a month like that and whenever I'm in KL that's that's when we, we will meet up it. yeah uh, I like uh, you know the amazing chemistry that you guys have and everything just like click when you just rekindle like and in 
2016 when you guys like came yeah. back together and yeah, uh, yeah everything it's, it's, it's a combination like uh, I, I wanted to have a creative project uh, to create something different for ourselves you know something different from what I wear to work you know at the time you know I see a lot of people wearing the normal high street high street working clothes work clothes uh, so I wanted to create something different for, 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 for me and also I wanted to be something that I, I have on the side that I think about other than just my banking work which is you know like ugh, you know I don't want to think about that too much so it, eventually it became I was drawn to it more and more rather than all the banking work uh, so yeah so it became more exciting to actually you know, the more we got involved in it um, the more exciting it became, you know, all the promotion, all the branding, all the, you know, the processing that we have to do, it became very, I, I find it very interesting and very, you know, uh, something like, you know, it, it really releases the stress, you know, the pent up stress inside of me. Yeah. Would you uh, probably introduce a little bit about Batik Tektura itself? So uh, with Batik Tektura, as you can see, we have, we have a bunch of uh, fabric behind here. Um, um, basically, uh, so it's it's a on the on the on the foundation on the base of it is a, a, a batik brand. So we create our own batik. Uh, we make our own clothing. Uh, you know, everything is all under one house, from the batik production to the clothing to the bags to the accessories production. Um, because my partner, yes, is actually an architect. So we leverage on that to actually become, you know, for architecture to become our signature uh, pattern. So we blend uh, architecture elements, concepts and all that into the traditional, this traditional art of making batik. So what you see is that you, you get like, um, like for Liku, it's actually a topographical uh, map of a place, uh, the place where we went to boarding school together. So it's actually, you know, every single uh, series that we make, every single batik series designs that we make actually has a reference to a particular uh, architecture concept or, or an element of a place. Uh, and it's something that's also related to architecture. So yes, you want to explain on that. It's really your field. Yeah, I would like to find out more about the thought process behind when you are coming out with a new design, which is um, okay. very, very interestingly different uh, from what we used to have. Yeah. So, Tony, the thing is, from the first day uh, we sat down, uh, it took us about a year uh, before we can actually um, come up with our first product. So, we did some, not some, it was quite a lot of uh, trial and error. Uh, because I, we were not able to have our own workshop at that time, so we decided to collaborate with the local bucket makers. Okay, uh, to find one is not easy. We started off with um, uh, somebody try and error, so that was a very costly try and error because uh, when we experimented, it didn't came out like what we wanted. And then we we decided to go for digital printing at one time. Uh, we actually that was our first product. Um, uh, it was a scarf, a hijab scarf with digital printing. But you know, to us, it wasn't the batik that we want. Yes, the pattern looks like a batik pattern, but it's not batik, you know, because batik is using wax resist, right? So we 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 didn't go ahead with that. We only had maybe two rounds of production, and that was it. And then uh, we were lucky. I was introduced to the block maker. So this uh, Potya, he is the one and only block maker in Kuala Terengganu right now, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, from from the from the old generation, right? There may be some new new ones right now, but we do not know who they are. Uh, so Potya is very famous in Malaysia. Uh, a lot of batik company goes to Potya to have their blocks done. So. Yeah, you know, it, it took us quite some time to convince Paya to do our pattern because he said, you know, this is something different than usual, right? And then I said, no, it's okay, Paya, you just do do it for us and we'll see how it comes out, you know, because we were still in experimenting stage. Then Paya was the one who got us hooked up with our 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 workshop right now. 
So, and again, the, the guys at the workshop was very, very skeptic to try. So when we told him, it's okay, if it's if it doesn't work out, we'll still pay you, you know, because we're experimenting. So, um, and good enough, he was responding well to our idea and he was very excited because he said it's something fresh. So, you know, so every now and then in between their daily production, when they do ours, it's something like breaking out of their normal pattern, right? Uh, so, um, so the thing about um, wanting to use architecture as our anchor is because there are so many things that can inspire you for a design, right? You know, like some people are being inspired by flora, some are being inspired by um, geometrical, you know, but um, knowing me, if you do not give me a focus, then things would go all over the place. So I thought, as Rina, you know, we need something to focus. So I said, because architecture is like, you know, my daily stuff and it comes to me naturally, that would be the best thing to anchor on. And the, the thing about architecture is you are not only really inspired by geometrical, you can only you can also be inspired by nature, right? Because both nature and architecture work together. So and then we we when you are familiar with something, so you would have a very strong understanding about it. So that's why we decided architecture. And because architecture is in Malay, is architecture, something like that, yeah. So we combined batik and architecture, so it, it became batik tektur. Then we were like, let's make it a little bit more, uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we nice do sir. like, we added the A, so it became batik tektura kind of thing. So that, that's how we came up with the name after a series of naming game and you know stuff like that so we finally decided on batik tektura oh the what the very first time that i first saw the word was i thought it's a batik tekstura uh, but so, it's, yeah I feel uh, a lot of people thought that also but it's actually a, a combination of batik and architecture yeah yeah but i thought uh even if it's like tekstura uh the one with uh, Liku and some of the designs uh, really has got a lot of different textures to it as well. So that name might make sense too. And how do you uh, incorporate the architectural designs into a batik design? Uh, no, normally, um, I, I would sketch something first, right? And I would scan and I send it to Azrina. So, and then we would see the feasibility of producing that into batik. So we have uh, a lot of design in our in our series, but not all are, are feasible for batik production. But it's normally something that um, I am, um, it's either something that I'm inspired from, from one of my works, or it's something that, you know, in, like as you know, say it's an element that I have worked with, or it's something that is part of architecture design. For for instance, um, like our Lorik, uh, which is one of our best selling. Uh, it's not there, but uh, you, you can ah, is there? Yes, that one. Okay, so I was designing for a local corporate brand. They wanted us to design their batik, right? So um, the the theme that they gave us was quite quite difficult. So um, I remember I was so stressed about uh, doing that design. So I took out my butter paper. Um, so I just started, you know, just started drawing, just you know, like five minutes stress out period, right, to distress things out. So I was just like, okay, kind of like doodling, right? yeah, <laughs> take my outline pen, zero point six, zero point four, zero point two. Okay, scribble, 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 and I just like. Oh, to a picture? Azrina, what do you think of this? She said, okay, yeah. let's do this. <laughs> so, yeah, this so and of a mindless sketching. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. So it's not like, you know, you, you take architecture that. literally. Uh, mm. So sometimes there are certain sketches that I've developed and Azrina would give some command on it. You know, perhaps you can, uh, you can tweak here a bit or that. So it's not just me designing hundred percent it's it's a collaborative work. This so, is another another good um example of how we incorporate architecture is like is in Bayang. 
Uh, you want to explain about Bayang? This is actually play a play. Um, shadows that you get through um, that 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 you see that come through the windows. So yeah. So uh, this one is very architectural because it's uh, inspired one by one of the buildings by Le Corbusier. Uh, so he designed this chapel. Uh, this chapel. So uh, it's a very famous building, and there, there's a lot of people who got inspired by it. So any architecture, anybody who is in architecture would definitely recognize this pattern and relate it to that building. So, so this is one one example that we take a direct inspiration from a building. Uh, but the others, like the silang, <coughs> silang what? is just silang, oh, silang. Okay. Oh, okay. So, uh, the, yeah. So this, uh, this silang is actually it's just a play of lines, you know. This yeah. is what we architects do sometimes when we, <laughs> we, we have like a mental block kind of thing. So it's just like, you know, putting things um together. But actually, it's is actually a, um. It's, it's a layers of line overlapping together. The one that Azuna is holding right now is just black and white, but the actual silang is where we have a few colors uh, overlapping each other. Yeah. Um, then we also have uh, Derek, which is oh, a Derek. Yeah. So this is about, uh, this is primarily about, um, is this primarily about line, line, like solids, a, line that. solids and voids? So it's an analogy to a city where in a city you have, a city is made up of lines, solids and voids, you know, where, where the solids are rep representing buildings, right? And lines are like the highways mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, so this is, this is again another experimental piece. So when we say it's an experimental piece, normally we do not produce it in quite big numbers. It's like being produced in very limited numbers, and normally we would not con we would not continue. We do have some other designs that we do for corporate brands, um, but when we do for corporate brands, normally we do what they want. If they do not want architecture, then we just follow whatever they want. And you have all these collections since twenty sixteen. 2017, we started selling. We yeah. started with digital printing first. You know, there were the ones that uh, yes talked about earlier where we uh, did some scarf, some shawls. Okay. Did pretty well, but uh, you know, like she said, we felt that it's not truly us because it's digitalized and uh, the, it just didn't feel butty enough for us. So then when we try all these other uh, paintings, it, uh, all these other collections. I think we start off with Tanjong and Kalsum first, right? And then Lore. And then Silang. Is it? I can't remember. Silang, Derek, and then Liku. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Bayang and Silang was about the same time. How often do you come up with a design? Uh, actually, we do, we release our design uh, just before uh, Ramadan. That's the usual. Uh, pattern but i think since the pandemic last year we have not been producing any um because even lee ku i i i had it done just before malaysia went into our first mco okay and because it was supposed to be ramadan in april right so when they shut down everything i couldn't go to the workshop to pick up the kain you know to, for Azrina to sell. So we miss uh, last year's season for Ramadan. I see. Um, so I think there's a lot that we need to learn and we need to adapt uh, in terms of production uh, with this new current lifestyle. So uh, even now, if we are to produce, um, it's going to be quite difficult because uh, as of today, the workshops are still closed. Mm. Yeah, workshop is still closed. Um, oh, they are not operating at all? We're not allowed to work. Oh, okay. I mean, uh, I, I mean moment, yeah, at the moment for Malaysia, only essential services are allowed to uh, open for to, to operate their businesses. And these wow. essential services are things like your petrol station, your the banks, 
uh, grocery shops. Yeah. Uh, that's about it. <laughs> <In most of it. laughs> so Tony, let's say if we have our own workshop in my backyard, yes, then we can produce. Yeah, yeah. Uh, provided it's a it's a personal workshop. But because the workshop involves workers and the workers are coming from other areas, so. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. That's the best thing to do to open the workshop now because yeah, if you yeah. get caught, you'll be compounded like yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not worth it, right? Yeah. Uh, so it's not worth it. So everybody is um is on hold right now. Even the big brands are not are not producing right now. Wow. And yeah. how are the workers surviving at this period? Uh, okay, as far as I know, uh, the workers at the workshop, they do have some sidekicks, you know. So, uh, they work, uh, I'm not sure what they do, but I do know they have some sidekicks. Huh? And as Rina, you mentioned earlier about uh, you did batik uh, printing and then you feel that it's not uh, enough. So, uh, can, can you explain a little bit more? The thing about doing batik by a, by a block uh, is that you know the the technique the hand application of it it makes the batik feel um, every single piece of uh, batik piece is different from the other although the pattern is the same you know but you you know the hand movement the way that the the wax drips onto the onto the fabric makes it like very unique you know the, the crackling you can you know you can put it you know side by side um, uh, every piece, uh, although it's the same pattern, it's actually they look quite different. The lines will be all applied differently and all that. So we felt that it's very, it's it's a lot. Um, it feels very unique, uh, as opposed to when you have digital printed, uh, digitally printed batik. Uh, every line is so perfect. You know, yes, you you told me that um, you know when you had to print the batik lines, all the lines seem so perfect, you know, and it was repeated consistently across all the entire length of the length of the fabric. And it doesn't feel like it's truly really, of course, you know, we, you know, for us, it doesn't, it just doesn't feel like it's the right attitude towards batik, you know, we wanted something a bit more unique. Uh, so, uh, although, although we won't disregard or, you know, completely not come back to digital batik printing ever again in the future. It, it is something that we want, you know, we keep, we will keep our options open, you know, digital printing, batik block or batik chanting or whatever applications of batik, it's fine. But uh, we, 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 the way that our customer demands right now, it seems to be more skewed towards uh, batik block rather than digitally printed batik. Maybe you can explain a little bit, like you know, in contrast to Malaysian batik. Uh, how, uh, if you can describe a little bit more about the uh, Malaysian batik as you knew uh, growing up versus uh, your designs. Here in Trengganu, the two the two most common batik technique would be the chanting and also by using block, right? Um, in terms of the chanting, their designs are quite um um quite diversified because it's it's more abstract and it's more uh free flow okay it depends on the designer so ever since <laughs> i remember when i was small uh, i would spend hours going from one shop to another shop to another shop until i find one batik that has the perfect pattern with the perfect color you know, because I am very fussy. Uh, so uh, sometimes you find nice pattern, but the color is not what you want. And sometimes the colors are nicely blended, but the pattern is a little bit off kind of thing. So it's quite hard to satisfy um, what, what people want, okay? Um, especially people who has, you know, um, high artistic appreciation. Okay, uh, with batik block, um, the, there, there are some like the very traditional uh, motif, okay, uh, but we don't, I don't see that anymore here. Um, so now the, the pattern are 
although they differ from one workshop to another workshop, but they are still about, you know, floral, fauna, you know, um, something similar to what you have at the back there. Okay. So it's, it's still very traditional. Well, well, they call this traditional pattern. Okay. Um, um, then now we're starting to see a little bit more geometrical patterns coming up. Um, but they still have that traditional element incorporated. Okay. So with ours, we decided to totally break free from that. You know, uh, we, we do not do the batik to be worn as sarong. All right. So like the ones that you, like the one that you have at the back there is mostly worn as sarong here. Yeah. Um, and sometimes people do make it into other items like shirts or blouses, but typically it's worn as a sarong. Okay. Um, so we, when we started, we didn't have the intention of selling it as a sarong. Um, our intention was to sell it as a two meter fabric to do whatever you want, but you can also wear it as a sarong. Okay. Um, so uh, we did experiment. Um, with lore yeah we did experiment with uh, lore to make it as the sarong right but somehow that version was not picking up much um in in comparison with our two meters fabric you see uh because maybe to some people uh, the traditional batik is still for the sarong and batik tektura is offering something other than sarong Okay, um, so um, in terms of, uh, that's why when I told Azrina we need something different to anchor our design. So that's why we, we, we went for all the architecture elements. So uh, how you want to use our fabric, so that's, that's up to, to um, the customers. And from what we can say, we are offering something different um from what is already in the market <laughs> yeah and and normally you know people who are in the arts like architects and everything they they just they just like love our brand yeah definitely i can see something uh different and refreshed uh that is uh not the normal traditional batik malaysia uh, or even traditional batik in general is it a, a correct assessment to say that uh, the traditional uh, people tend it to uh, wear it as a sarong and then in a way for modern batik maker or for modern patterns, they have a lot more uh, creative uh, expression or explorations in their design? Well, I, I think you, maybe because it's how batik has been portrayed, you know. Uh, all this while when we see batik is always as a sarong, right? But I think we, we also see that there are people who, who makes the, the batik sarong into like kebaya or into mansion. And, and I think um, the thing what I like about Indonesian batik is how you turn batik into wearable stuff, right? Um, not just saro, not just as men shirt or kebaya, but I, I've seen a lot of your uh, the Indonesian local batik making it into skirts um, and and things like that. Okay, and the same thing is also being explored in Malaysia right now. Okay, uh, not just by the traditional makers, but also by the new makers like us. So I think batik is moving forward in the in in a direction where it is more relevant. Getting, yeah, it it it's, it's become something more um more adaptable, something that you can use it uh in in a more uh creative way rather than just um um sarong, okay? Yeah. Um, but it it depends. I think you shouldn't limit batik just to a certain thing. It can be anything actually. People are like we make uh clutches, you know um mask um what else um uh, household household products so um you shouldn't stop it just there la. i mean you know if you can explore it further go ahead right exactly yeah. ultimately it is on uh 
materialized textiles for you to apply further. So, yeah. uh, I, I mean, like uh, when we talk about Malaysian batik uh, using the, uh, the standard Malaysian batik uh, motif, like kucuk rebong, uh, I think a lot of people, a lot of batik makers in Malaysia have done that, are doing that, uh, have been done that for, for many years, and it's already in the market. So many, so many of them out there. So, we don't want to do something that's already bred, it's already there. And so that is how we differentiate, differentiate ourselves from what's already available in the market. So this is our how we anchor, how we present, how, how the brand represents. So if you want something different, then this is what we are. Uh, so after the design process and then you uh, bring it to the workshop and uh, you mentioned a little bit about the response of the batik maker. Uh, so so how, how do you uh, work with them? Uh, okay. they, were, they were reluctant in the first place, right? When they look at our designs, they're a little bit too crazy. <laughs> like, what in the world are you asking us to do? <laughs> I, I, for the first time, Tony, the very, very first time, I had a hard time convincing uh, the blockers to block the pattern, okay? Uh, because it's something very different and the way the blocking system is also different, Okay. Um, how blocks are being done for the traditional sarong is not the same as how we do ours, right? Um, because uh, the stamping process. Or? Yeah, yeah, the stamping process. So um, normally, uh, I would do the first prototype. Mm -hmm. I would show them the first prototype, like this is how I want it, okay? And this is how you should block it right um so after we run uh, the first series of experiment normally for every every series that we do there is there is always the first set of experiment okay um so that experiment pieces uh, is normally um is normally is is normally uh, very challenging to convince them okay this is how it's done because there are some of our pieces uh, that would take them longer to do, okay, in comparison to their day-to-day -day, uh, sarong uh, stamping, right? So to convince them to, to spend that extra time is not easy. Uh, but after a while, when they are used to it already, they, they wouldn't, there's not much problem uh, with getting them to do. Um, so you see when when i design my block okay i would take the the sketch to my blockers first all right so we would sit down together and see how how are we going to block this on fabric okay because we've done one design before which was simply impossible to produce it commercially because one two meter piece would take 40 minutes so that's not possible because in our production, in our production, one piece shouldn't take them more than five minutes, okay, to block a two meter. So every time before we started turning the sketch into the brass block, we would sit down together with the blockers and discuss like, okay, how, how are we going to do this block? How many blocks do we actually need to have this pattern out? So there are some patterns that you only require one block. And there are some patterns that you require up to three blocks. So, so, um, so you see, they this is something new for them because previously they didn't have this kind of arrangement, you know. So, <coughs> it is fair to say that we get everybody involved from the very beginning to the very end. So, even when it comes to colors, um, you see, what we've done is we have a series of color swatches. So I have one set and uh, uh, and they have one set. So we would just like go through the color swatches together and we would see whether, okay, you know, uh, is it really possible for these colors to be together and whatnot. So um, the initial production stage <coughs> is quite lengthy. And once we get everything correct, then it'll just be very fast. As compared to regular stamping, what are the differences? Um, okay, uh, the regular stamping, if they, they are to make batik sarong, they have a few different types of uh, blocks. You know, they have the, the blocks for the body, the blocks for the kapala, and the okay. blocks for the kaki, right? Uh, we don't have that. Uh, we okay. don't go by that, that kind of blocking system, you see? 
Um, so our blog is a little bit more, um, you know, like I said, if it's just one blog, then it's, it's just a, it's just stamping. It's just one blog stamping, right? But um, what they always complain to me is, can you please make the joints really? easier? Uh, so I they see. say it's very hard to control the joints. You know, my some of our patterns need to be joined precisely. Yeah. Or else it will uh, not be nice. You know, like silang, um, uh -huh. like silang, um, silang is quite hard to join. Mm. Uh, so, so, so that's why I like this. Are this are one of the reason like why they find it, they yeah, find it difficult, crazy hard, yeah, to do quite hard to join that. Is it because our batik block is is only about an A four size paper? Yes, right. So the fabric is two meters this way and forty five inch the other way. So how how are you going to join is very very important. Yes, um, yeah, I was uh trying to design a parang which is like the diagonal. Yeah, that is so difficult to join. Yes. And definitely, I understand the pain if it is not aligned yeah. and you are not used to it. Yeah, jointing is another thing. Overlapping is another thing. Right, so when you like silang is really hard for them because first they have to join it correctly, mm -hmm. and then when they go for the second overlap, they have to they have to join the o lines over yeah. the o lines. So you know you're gonna get cross eyes and stuff like that. So, but but because because we understand how things work, so when we design, we design with them in our mind. You know, like okay, is it possible for them to stem this in five minutes? Is it easy for them to join? You know. And you know, if if the joint goes off, would there be a big gap and stuff like that? Because um, the thing about playing with uh, blocking is you need to control the gap size. So if there's a bit too much gap, then you will get a, a you know some color inconsistency when you do the dyeing. So we need to close the gap as much as possible. It seems like you know the conceptually is yes, like very simple. Very but, simple, yeah. definitely not. Yeah. It's yeah. quite difficult. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I do the blocking on my own sometimes, but you know, they would just say, "No, you're too slow. Move over." <laughs> yeah, fast because Liku, Liku is also not straightforward, right? As we thought. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. Of joining blocks, joining you know, like the the separate lines. Do you actually have your own workers? We use the the um, batik workshop workers. Essentially, they are our third party uh, outsourcing partner. Mm -hmm. the, thing, the thing about these workshops, uh, Tony, uh, last time Chenglano has like hundreds of workshops doing batik block, yeah. right? Uh, but I think now it's less than 10. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, so I think when we first started, we did we did wanted to have our own workshop, right? Can I think at yeah. first. Then we thought like let's help let's help them rather than competing with them. So uh we finally found one workshop that was willing to explore our idea. So we've been collaborating with them ever since. Um and in fact I think when we won third place in uh Batik Street and Don. Uh, they were happy because that was the first time their batik got out on the national scene, you know. Um, so to us, it was very rewarding to be able to help a small workshop here uh, to go up to uh, Sri Endon and we actually won the place. So, oh, Yeah, I'm amazed at the number. It used to be 100 and now there are like only 10 workshops. Because the young ones are not interested to inherit their father's, their father's workshop, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. because... I have to admit, uh, being at the workshop is very, very tough because it's yes. hard, it's very laborious, uh, you know, standing for about four or five hours a day, right? So uh, things are not all would want to do that, you know, when now you can be making money just having a TikTok account kind of thing. <laughs> what are some of the challenges? Challenges in competition, well, they're very stiff. Um, I have to admit, um, because we also do, uh, currently this business operates on a, it's not full time. There's only me and yes. And uh, up until yesterday or the day before, we were still doing it uh, part time. You know, I've, I'm only 
you know, I'm on a career break at the moment. So now only I can actually concentrate this on full time, you know, but only starting to. Uh, but in the past, we've only been given, uh, you know, 20% of our time to batik, to promote it. You know, with social media, it's actually, social media is actually a 24 hour thing. If you want to get your brand uh, exposed and be at the top of mind of people, you need to actually be putting yeah, out content. Yeah. Every day, yeah, engagement every minimum two two days, every two days or three days, and you have to keep going. So, not when while I was a being a banker at the time, it was really hard to do that. So, it was probably in an update once every two weeks or something, you know, because you also have your family to take care of. Moving forward, we want to actually uh, keep up, you know, keep up with the competition. Uh, so, we have we hope to increase our exposure in the future. How about you? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Because I'm I'm on the production side, uh, so um, I think the the biggest challenge right now is we're not having enough successes. Okay. Um, so uh, let's say if the current batik workshops cease to operate, to find new talents are not easy. Um, it's as good as starting from zero. And the thing about uh, Bate, especially uh, using the block method, it's practice makes perfect. You see? Um, because the this, this is a traditional craft, right? Uh, traditional craft, they do not pass down to you in the form of a book or a manual. It's something that you have to be trained. You know, you have to have a guru, right? So if you want to master the art, let's say if I want to, to be a master blocker, right, Tony, I have to leave my architecture, go to the workshop and work work there for them, you know, then only I, my blocking would improve. Uh, so that is that is one of the biggest challenge right now, um, especially uh, the brass block, okay? Mm, the current block maker, uh, he doesn't have a successor, right? So if he goes, all the knowledge that he has goes with him. Okay, uh, it's not that um, he he they didn't want to have people to to share their knowledge. It's just that people are not interested. Okay, um, so I think that is one thing. I mean, the government has made some initiative like having a workshop, or we even have uh, an institute here in Malaysia uh, that teaches batik, all sorts of techniques. Uh, but not all of their graduates would venture into the business. Okay, so we at the very beginning, uh, we worked with one of uh, the graduates from uh, that institute. Uh, but of recently, uh, I contacted him and he said, no, I stopped doing it because it wasn't lucrative enough, you know. So the thing about Bakit is it takes time to make money. Uh, so I think um, people would like to make fast cash nowadays with the current economic situation. Right. Um, so it's it depends on how persevere can you be, yeah. Um, and then the other thing that the challenges that we face is in terms of um, getting our stocks uh, to produce, like fabrics, um, like colors. You know, you you know the thing is we get our fabrics from Indonesia. Oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so um, at one time, uh, everybody was short of this one particular material. And this material is imported from Indonesia. And only a licensed importer can import that, that material. Okay, surprisingly, Malaysia does not produce um, our own local fabric uh, for batik. Oh, like not even cotton fabric. Oh. Imported yeah, from... The raw fabric, the the raw fabric, uh, yeah, the but it's imported from uh, Indonesia. So um, sometimes we we have to buy off from uh, people who who imports it from uh, Indonesia. So that's you know in terms of price, so these kind of things affect pricing, and uh, and because it's being imported by a certain party, so they control what fabric they want to bring in. So uh, I used we used to use this one particular cotton and now it's out. So you see, we have to produce with what is given to us. You know, we don't have choice uh, to get what we want. Uh, so th the same thing with the color powders as well. 
you know, there was this one ping, it was so nice, and now they stop importing that ping. I can't get that ping anymore. And and I think is this digital technology is also imposing a big challenge to the local batik making. Uh, because they could produce batik at a faster rate and they could produce it at a way cheaper cost, right? And they are selling it way cheaper than traditional uh, batik. And There's a lot, lot of people who can't differentiate between digital or hand-printed batik. So they see one digital batik, they expect, you know, the price should be the same for hand-printed batik as well. You know, so yeah, so so it's so a lack of awareness as well in in the you know amongst uh, in amongst the consumers in terms of uh, uh, the this quality hard work that goes into um, a, a hand printed technique. Um, I'm not sure about the the chanting because we are not in in that group yet. Uh, but I I reckon they do they do have their own challenges as well. But I would reckon if I were to take a guess. It would getting um uh, getting people to do the chanting nowadays is probably not many people are doing it also. Well, um, thank you so much for sharing. It's been like a very eye opening to learn about the ecosystem of batik makers in Malaysia, which some uh, problems are kind of like similar to Indonesia in terms of regenerations. But I didn't know about uh material store shortage that uh the industry has that. And what's upcoming for you guys? Uh, any interesting projects that we can uh, yes. look for from Batik Tekta? Um, yes, we need to produce more designs. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, <Aero> yes. <laughs> as soon as this uh, MCO, where, you know, as soon as we can travel, you know, at least in the district again, you know, I want to get some designs out because we haven't been able to produce the design, a new design for over a year now and uh, and also in the in the medium term we would have we would want to have our own uh, physical space because i feel that just just being digitally online is not enough under uh, movement control restriction so we have to actually only be engaging in selling online and which is actually you know with colors and or designs like this it's actually it doesn't do justice, you know, when you see something physically, it's actually, um, you know, it's better to actually see it with your own eyes, yes. feel it in your hands, uh, as compared to seeing it on social media. Yes. But it's fine, we will still continue promoting and improving our social, our interface, uh, digital interface with our customers. But at the same time, in the medium term, we would also like to have our physical uh, space because I want to have a team, you know, to create a team where I can work with marketers, with um, crafters and tailors all in one place, you know, so we can collaborate and ideate all together instead of all the separate places that we are at the moment. And we are almost uh, talking for okay. an hour. Yeah. Maybe a uh, final uh, closing words that you might have. Uh, a shout out for Batik Tektura or your hopes for uh, Batik in general? A shout out. Um, yes. Well, as you know, as we've mentioned that we are, we, our signature, we, we are a Batik company with a signature uh, concept uh, where we blend in, infusing architectural elements into it. You're not going to find that anywhere else. Only we do it. So, um, you will find the design more refreshing and very different and very unique. Um, so come and have a look at our Instagram or our Facebook account. Um, or we are also on some uh, uh, digital uh, e-commerce platform called Poptron. We are also, you know, we also sell on that platform as well. So do check us out. Um, you know, um, we will love to have you as our customers and you also ask questions uh, to us if you want to you want some question you have some you want some answers about certain certain things certain designs that we have you know we're more than willing to take your any of your questions your queries uh your keep you know and satisfy your curiosity so yeah so do check us out um and also in terms of our future you know we hope to grow our business uh bigger 
uh, make it more uh, accessible to everyone. You have physical presence as, as in few cities, cities probably if we can. Um, yeah, so that is that is uh, my last shout out to uh, who to all the people who are watching us today. Okay, thank you, Azira. How about you, yes. Um, okay, um, I think um, I hope that people will consider Batik um, as our priceless um, heritage. Okay, um, it is the heritage of the Nusantara, right? Uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei. So uh, we need to preserve it because uh, once it's gone, you can never get it back again. Okay, um, so uh, my hope is that people would wear more batik, the original batik, okay, and there would be more people uh, who would want to take up this um, um, this traditional craft as um, as an industry as as an industry or as their job or as a, as a career. Um, even if you don't like batik, buy one and keep it and pass it down to your children as as a members of our um, rich culture and heritage because um, this is something which is only unique to us, right? And you don't want other people to take it away from us. So if we do not keep it, we do not take care of it, we're, you know, we might, you know, lose it someday. So, um, I, I am hoping that wouldn't happen um, and we're hoping that um, uh, we would make it more, um, uh, we would see Batik more in the in the market to come um, and yeah, pakailah uh, Batik. Yes. All right, okay, in every sense, in every sense. If, if you come here to Trangganu, you'll see men wearing Batik Sarong. Yes. Uh, not just women, men wearing batik yes, sarong. Because it's unisex. Yes, having a cup of coffee, all right, by the beach. So it's something that you, it's because it, it has to be part of you. It has to be not just something, a cultural heritage, but it's part of you. So wear as much batik as possible. It's comfortable for us because, you know, uh, the fabric is breathable and our weather is so hot, right? And um, the colors keep your mood up, so it's it's a perfect thing for us in the Nusantara. Yes. Okay. I definitely can't wait for borders to open up to go lay down in a Trunganu beach and yeah, wearing sarong and drinking coffee. <laughs> yes. Once again, thank you so much, Yes and uh, Azrina, for dropping by today. I learned a lot and I enjoy myself. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting us, Tony. This is such a this is such a good exposure for us too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you like this interview, do check out our previous chat with other guests over on our IGTV or read it on our website www.anardgallery.com. And do follow us on social media at Anard Gallery on Facebook and Instagram to find out more about our future events and happenings. And until next time. Stay safe and take care.